Good day, Cami. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thank you for having me, guys. It's really, really fun to be here with you today. Now, you and I have never met face to face uh, in person or virtually, but I've been following you for quite a long time. And uh, I, I, I've read your book. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I have the uh, the, ver uh, the uh, ebook version of it, so I can't hold it up and show the audience. But uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, but so I've kind of been a fan of yours for quite a while. So uh, again, thank you for doing this. So I have a four part introduction of you that I'm going to walk you through, and I've shared these questions with you in advance, so you have no excuses for not having an answer. But... No excuse. <laughs> so. Uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and then segue into where did you grow up? Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, Cami Bean. Um, I am a senior solutions consultant with Kineo. We'll talk about that in a bit. I grew up kind of all over the place. My dad was in the Navy, um, like you, Guy, um, and he was a submariner, and we traveled a fair amount. So I was born in Virginia. We moved to Hawaii. We moved to Connecticut. Uh, in the mid seventies, um, we lived in Germany for three years. We lived on a base in Stuttgart, uh, West Germany. Then in 1977, we moved back to Hawaii. Uh, my dad was stationed at Pearl Harbor and that's where he ended up retiring. And we grew up, I grew up, I, I finished growing up, I guess I should say, um, in Kailua, which is on the windward side of Oahu. And, um, I lived there, you know, through high school. I graduated from the same high school Obama, Barack Obama went to called Punahou. Um, I left, I left Hawaii when I went to college. I went to upstate New York. I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I studied English and German studies uh, at Cornell um, with kind of, you know, mm, not a great picture of what, what I wanted to be when I grow up. I kind of thought I would get into education or teaching at the time. And uh, I spent a, my junior year abroad living in Hamburg. Uh, this is before the wall fell down. So it was still east and west. It was the year before that happened. Um, and then I came back to Ithaca. After I left Ithaca, I moved to the Boston area where I have lived for 32 years now, which is shocking. <laughs> I've lived in this house for 17 years. I've never lived anywhere this long in my entire life. Um, and so I've been in the Boston area since the early 90s. Um, and that was an interesting time to move to Boston. I lived in Cambridge, actually. Uh, it was early 1990s. There had been a real recession here in New England. So moving to Boston was not a good, not really a good career move, but um, I, I loved it. I wanted to have that feel of a kind of a, an East Coast European style city. I figured I'd stay here for a couple of years and then move back to the West Coast where a lot of my family is from. Um, my brothers have moved off. None of us live in Hawaii anymore. Um, so, you know, I kind of identify as a West Coast person, but I've lived here in Massachusetts now for 32 years, which is shocking. Um, it was a hard time to find work and kind of figure out what you wanted to be. I worked as the assistant aquatics director at a Jewish community center in Newton. Um, I had been a competitive swimmer growing up. So I was working with kids and helping run an aquatics program. And I was temping a lot. So kind of, you know, going down a state street and working in the big high rise and figuring out what business was all about. Uh, at some point, I got into this company called Work Family Directions, which was this awesome organization, uh, really progressive, a lot of really smart uh, people who were really interested in helping employees of companies balance their work and family lives. So we were kind of an early pioneer in that space. And we had a call center. Um, so we had counselors who were talking on the phone to employees of companies and it was 1992, 1993. I'm sure you remember this guy. Computers were happening, right? Like we were, all these businesses were transforming to computer-based where everything had been on paper. And so the way I kind of fell into to training and instructional design, um, well, I had, I had actually applied to go to BU to get a master's degree in teaching. I was kind of thinking I'd go the secondary school route. And then I started earning a paycheck and I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. And maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stick with this. Um, so meanwhile, we're designing a new uh, computer-based uh, 
call center training application for our counselors. And I was on the operations team. So kind of in the back, you know, the back office function, uh, I had this ability to speak to the end users about what their needs were and this ability to speak to the IT nerds who were programming it and mocking up screens and figuring out workflows. And then as is often the case, I was kind of the subject matter expert now in this system. I had the ability to do, you know, jazz hand performance in front of a in front of a live studio audience um, and I could write. So I got tapped for training, for training on the system. Um, and that's really what got me started down the whole instructional designer path. Um, and then eventually I got, I had been there for about five years and eventually I got a job at my first, I'll call it an e-learning company. It was before we called it e-learning. It was a computer-based training company. We, we developed things on CD-ROMs. <laughs> um, and it was back in the day when some of the first projects I was working on, we were actually converting laser disc programs onto CD-ROM. So you probably remember all that too, Guy. Um, you know, software systems training, we were shipping things out on laptops to people. There was no LMS back in the day. There were no authoring tools. Everything was custom coded, hand designed from scratch. Um, and interesting, so my first day on that job, I got my business card and it said junior instructional designer. And I had never heard of, you know, I mean, I had obviously I had interviewed for this job. So I, I knew of this job title, but it was it was all new to me. Um, so kind of by accident, I like to say I, I, you know, I fell into this by accident. That's the name of my book, The Accidental Instructional Designer. Um, and, you know, 26 years later, I'm still in this field. I'm still chugging ahead. So so let's let's end up there where you were working for the company doing CBT kinds of things and your position now, what, what other uh, jobs did you have along the way? And can you share with us maybe some of the more interesting projects that you had uh, occasion to work on? Yeah, sure. So um, it's been a long and storied career guy. Where do it, what are the highlights? So um, I was at VIS, we were called video information systems. Um, and it was super glamorous because we did a lot of video. We did a, we would go into the studio and shoot talking head and, you know, scenario based training back in the day, we were doing video fairly early before people were doing a lot of it because it was so heavy, the files. And, um, you know, it took a lot of resources to, you'd hire a production crew, you'd hire, you know, editors, all that kind of stuff. Um, today it's very different, right? Everyone can just, just pick up their phone and, and, and do video. Um, and so uh, the very first day of my very first instructional designer job, I actually got on a plane and I went to, I flew to DC <laughs> and I started doing needs analysis with, uh, with a client, it was a bank. Um, and it was just really exciting. I loved it. I loved getting to learn all of these different domain areas. So people would just, you know, offer me, they'd be like, you should come work for us. And it would be Ames department store and we'd be doing POS system training and, um, you know, in a store in the middle of the night shooting video of a, you know, actors, you know, pretending to be customers, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was there for about five years and we did not navigate the dot com uh, burst very well. So the company eventually split off. Actually, half of it became Integrity Interactive, which is a, um, a fairly big name in the compliance e learning space. I I think they've since gotten bought by SAI Global. You know, all these all these companies have have uh, merged and combined. Um, I took a little sidebar journey there, and I became a, a massage therapist. Uh, so this was early 2000s. Again, we're here we're here in another recession, and there, there's kind of a trend in my life where, you know, things you start getting ready for the next thing or, or looking for that next thing. And I, you know, I decide I want to open a coffee shop or become a potter or, or become a massage therapist. So I, I went to massage therapy school. Um, when I applied at the massage therapy school and interviewed the woman, the first thing she said to me, the admission person is, wow, I could see you teaching here. And I ended up, I, that ended up happening. I graduated in 2002 from the massage school, uh, Muscular Therapy Institute in Cambridge. And I became an instructor. I loved it. It was hands on. It was, you know, like quite literally, um, you know, and I had had to learn anatomy and physiology and um, self care and boundaries and all this stuff. It was great. Meanwhile, I was also still freelancing doing um, e learning, 
instructional design for small firms in the in the Massachusetts uh, Boston area. Um, we had we started having kids. This is a lot of my personal story. Um, started having kids. It became clear that my husband and I, one of us, needed to actually you know be a steady breadwinner and get the insurance and all that kind of stuff. So I. Um, just given where I had been career-wise, it made sense for me to go back. So I found a, a, a small boutique e-learning shop here in Massachusetts that was owned by a brother and sister, and I started working for them. Um, and we did similar projects to what I had done at VIS. It was, you know, building a, um, training for Roche Brothers supermarkets, or <laughs> um, <clears throat> we did some stuff with Sikorsky on the um, uh, Blackhawk, actually, that was pretty cool. A lot of 3D modeling. Um, we worked with uh, Continental Airlines. We had, you know, all sorts of different projects. So there I started to become, you know, more of a senior instructional designer role at that point. I had been doing it for almost 10 years at that point. This is 2005. Um, it dawned on me at that point that um, this was likely to be my career trajectory, you know, and that this was what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life to, in, to some extent. I mean, not that you can't redefine yourself at any, any point. I, I stopped doing the massage. I had, I had three kids, a full-time job. I was trying to teach and practice as a muscular therapist at the, at the same time. And it was, it was too much. So I had to let, I let the massage go. Um, and, you know, you, you got to simplify sometimes. So I missed that work, but uh, I had plenty of other people to care for in my life. Um, so around this time in, in 2005, I started connecting online. Um, blogging was the big thing. And there was this big group of e-learning professionals that were starting to think out loud, share out loud, work out loud. You were probably part of that guy. you know. So in those early days, I started connecting with people like Brent Schlenker, Clark Quinn, Jane Bozarth. Uh, it was really exciting. I started a blog, which was really me sort of making this decision at that stage in my career where I had been this accidental instructional designer and um, recognizing that there was a big profession out there and like, you know, a lot of professionals like yourself, you know, saying, hey, this shouldn't be so accidental. We need to, you know, follow process. There's, you know, a, not that there's a, a right way to do it, but there are better ways to do it, right? So um, I had three young children. I was not going back to school at that time. So I decided I would get an informal degree in instructional design. And I set about really trying to educate myself better. Um, started reading a ton of books, started connecting with all of these people online. In 2007, I went to my first learning guild, e-learning guild at the time conference, which was here in Boston um, and started making more connections. I remember sitting in a session with Clark Quinn and just, you know, huge eyes. It was also exciting and new to me and going to the bookstore and buying, you know, learning books, which, you know, made me feel very official. Um, Will Talheimer was at that, Stephen Downs, Brent, Brent Schlinker, you know, it was just this big eye-opening experience. And there I was sitting at tables with these people. I felt like I was brushing with the shoulders of giants. It was very exciting. Um, so that was in 2007. Um, and I was with that company for about five years. And then Kineo came along. Um, I had connected with the owners of Kineo um, at that conference, actually. Uh, but the Kineo had been, was founded in 2005 in the UK as an e-learning design and development firm. And um, I met the owners. I, I had, they were doing a really good job with content marketing and sharing rapid resource guides and, you know, tools and tips and tricks for instructional designers. So I was constantly reading this stuff too, because it was so great, all the content they shared. Um, and then in 2009, they were starting to look to open a U.S. operation and reached out to me and, uh, you know, initially wanted a salesperson. And I said, oh, that's not me, but I, you know, I'll see if I know anybody. And, um, and then a couple of weeks later, because I couldn't find anyone that, you know, I, I did check my network kind of a thing. And, um, and they, Steve Rayson emailed me back and said, actually, what we think we want is an instructional designer who can build relationships with clients and, you know, do the work. And I was like, oh, that's totally me. So 13 years ago, as of two days ago, my anniversary with Kineo is uh, 5'11". So um, it's been 13 years I've been with Kineo. I was the uh, head of the learning design team here in the U.S. for the first six years. 
And then I made this, uh, this very suspicious shift. I became a salesperson. So I am now in sales, uh, which my, my title is solutions consultant, senior solutions consultant slash account director. Um, and really what that means is I am working with clients throughout their life cycle. So I manage the account relationship. I deal with contracts. I deal with a lot of the business stuff of it. Um, but I'm also working with clients very early to architect solutions and identify what problems they're trying to solve. I speak the language of instructional design. I have a lot of credibility because I've done this. I've worked really closely with our production team for 13 years. Um, and Sometimes I am surprised. I look around. I think, how did I'm a salesperson? What? Um, but it's it's so much more than that. Um, it's more than sales. It's really working with clients because we have this big production team. Um, it's you know one of the benefits of being at an organization like Kineo is everyone can specialize in what we do best. So uh, you know we can talk about this a little bit about instructional design. Um, it comes in many shapes and flavors. Uh, and everybody calls, everybody defines instructional design a little bit differently if you talk to different organizations. At Kineo, we all specialize. So we have, you know, I'm a, a solutions consultant, account director. We have project managers. We have senior learning consultants. We have content writers. We have, you know, learning experience designers. We have developers. We have graphic artists, art directors, QA people. So we split that all out at many organizations. And some of you watching this may, you know, say, I do all of those things, right? Um, and yep. that's kind of the reality at a lot of organizations is instructional design means all of these things. So um, I feel really fortunate in, in where I've landed and how I've been able to evolve that over the years. And, you know, it's not a straight path for people, um, but there really is a career and uh, a, a way to go and, and find what makes you tick and figure out, you know, what your, you know, instructional design, performance consulting, you know, it's kind of a T-shaped skill set we talk about, right? There's so much that you need to know about from a broad level, but you start to deepen your understanding in a few key, key, key areas. Thank you so much for, for that. Whew. And I, I, think that, I think that's right. And I think that's important for the audience to understand is that you can be a generalist in this and kind of do everything. And you, or you could be a specialist in this thing and you may be able to do everything, but you might begin to specialize in certain things, the things that you're strongest in or that appeal to you the greatest. Uh, uh, but so you've been on my list to talk to you for quite a while, actually. This is about the 156th or seventh uh, one of these videos that I'm doing. And this is all about human performance technology or human performance improvement. It's called many different things, but it, it's about affecting performance um, through various means. And sometimes we're dealing with the human uh, portion of the equation. And sometimes we're dealing with things outside the human, the environment, the data, the equipment, the process that they're using or whatever. But so my sense is that you are really a performance oriented person and you may specialize in instruction or training or learning experiences as, as these things are now uh, called. Um, but can you share with us a little bit about, did you get a performance orientation? Where did that come from? Who were some of your influences in looking at instruction or training or, or learning experience through that kind of uh, lens? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think from, you know, as someone who's been designing, developing, training all this time, um, 26 years, it's been an evolution along the way. It's not like I started off going, it's all about performance, right? Initially it was like, oh, it's all about teaching all the clicks on your software system because that's what I've, that's what I was told to do, right? And you're kind of figuring that out as we go along. Um, and over time I had exposure to people who had that more performance mindset, right? Like understanding, wow, what we're trying to do is change performance, change behavior. It's not about just vomiting up you know, all the information, all the clicks, all the info, ultimately, we want to transfer that to the job. And, and the way, you know, as I, the way Kineo thinks about the way I think about it is we are driving for results, we want to be very results oriented. Um, and, you know, it's got, there's got to be some alignment back to the business, you know, the business needs and really core to our design process is understanding who is that user, 
what are the business objectives? What are the performance objectives? You know, what do we want people to be able to do at the end of the day? Um, you know, Kathy Moore was super uh, influential in that, right? Like, what do you want people to be able to do? Like, oh, right. This is about what's the action you're going to take back on the job and how do we translate that into something um, that's going to stick ultimately. Um, so you, you had asked about, you know, names and um, who, who is sort of influencing me. Certainly in those early days, the, the people I was reading, Ruth Clark, right, all about evidence-based performance um, design. Um, Dr. Michael Allen from Allen Interactions, the e-learning guides, like that was all focused on what do you want people to be able to do? Um, Carl Kopp, um, you know, he's very focused on that end result. So he talks a lot about games and micro learning now. And, and he, I mean, Carl was, was super awesome in the early, I remember in like 2006, 2007, he was showing me Second Life, which I'm having flashes of now because, you know, everyone's talking about the metaverse and I feel like we're having a flashback to 2007 again. Um, he just made himself super accessible and, and was really he is so interested in moving the practice forward, right? Like I mean, there's just people out there who want to do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis training and performance improvement and not just be creating crappy, sorry, crappy, you know, PowerPoint slides with the logo in the top right corner that has all the words dumped into them. Um, Will Talheimer, um, Meg or Jane Bozarth, um, Julie Jerkson's book, Designed for How People Learn, love it. It's one of my favorite books. Um, she's, you know, brilliant. Um, Kathy Moore, recently I've been reading like Rance Green's book on instructional um, storytelling, right? Like how, how do we, because a lot of the, the, you know, a lot of our clients, what we hear from them is, you know, their top priorities are creating more engaging experiences, right? That are actually, everyone's just inundated with so much e-learning, especially now, right? After the last two years of the pandemic. So how do we make sure that what we are doing is engaging and engaging is not about jazz hands, it's, you know, that's, that's distracting, right? We want something that's going to actually pull you in. That's going to be relevant. That's going to have that what's in it for me factor. That's going to help you transfer it back onto the job to your performance. Um, you know, meanwhile, leaders at these organizations are trying to figure out how to reduce seat time, how to prove the value, what's the evidence to show that what we've done and, and data and analytics, like that's a huge black hole for the l and field, right? Everyone talks it, but mm, not everyone really knows how to execute on that yet. Um, you know, it's, it, I think it's, it's, there's still a bleeding edge happening around data and metrics. And you and we could probably talk about that for a long time because, you know, often what we're trying to evidence is, business results change, right? It's bottom line, it's stuff that you can't really measure directly in a learning solution. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause. You, you asked me a question and I talked for five minutes, Guy. <laughs> no, that's okay, that, that, but that was great. I think your, maybe your next book could be The Accidental Performance Technologist or something along those lines here because you do have that performance orientation you're not so overt about that, but I've sensed that uh, throughout all the time I've been following you. But so thank you for that. So let's segue into a question that wasn't on my list of questions, but let's talk about your book now, The Accidental Instructional Designer. And this you, you published this in 2014. Uh, could you uh, tell us, uh, uh, tell the audience, you know, who you wrote the book for, what you hope their takeaways are, and, and weave into there somehow the, the backstory about what, you know, what caused you to write this. And I, you know, it's, it's in the front of the end of the book, but, uh, but go ahead and, and share that with our audience, please. Yeah, excellent. So the Accidents of the Instructional Designer I wrote in 2014, and I am actively involved right now in updating it. So um, there will be a new edition coming out next year. Um, I'm just working on, you know, adding some adding some new things that have happened in the last eight years and some new insights. So uh, it's, I wrote it, it, it I, I always wanted to be a writer too. So I wanted to be a writer and a, a, a teacher. And in fact, that's exactly what I have been able to do with my career, which has been very exciting and gratifying. Um, and I was doing a lot of writing for Kineo um, and I had been blogging even prior to that. So I had a lot, I, have, I had a big body of work. Um, and that first, the, the first edition, uh, 
you know, accidental instructional designer is really written towards the bulk of the people who get into this field, right? We get here by accident. And then, you know, you're, you're a subject matter expert and you're like I was at my first job and you become tapped like, hey, you know about this system, you should be the trainer now. And you're like, what, what does that mean? Um, or you hear about someone in an organization whose boss just suddenly says, here, turn all these PowerPoint decks into training. And now suddenly they have to learn how to use articulate and they're trying to figure out this whole huge field, right? So there's many of us that fall into it by accident. Um, I have given a lot of workshops on the accidental instructional designer. It's always very gratifying because there's a room full of people who, not that they're all shell-shocked looking, but there is such comfort in knowing that you are not alone. You're not the only one figuring this out for the first time. Um, all of us are, you know, for the most part. Mo most people, unfortunately, are figuring this out for the first time as they get into it. And um, there's often a real kumbaya moment in the room when people realize they're not alone and that there is a community out there that they can, draw, you know, get support from, that they can tap into. There's books, there's, you know, knowledge. It's so in some ways, my book is like a jumpstart guide for those getting into the field. Um, I try to, as I'm updating it, it's like, I, you know, I want to point you to all the, all the other books, all the books that I've read, right? This is how I learned. This is where I've get, you know, gotten my expertise over the years is from reading, you know, that book by Carl Kopp or that book by Will Talheimer or, you know, just helping people connect and, and hopefully it won't take them 25 years to, <laughs> You know, we, we got to jumpstart this because accidents are going to continue to happen. Um, I don't think it's ever going to go away. There's always been this debate, you know, do you need a degree or do you not need a degree in this field? And, um, you know, we can have that age old debate about whether or not you'd have an architect build your, you know, would you would you have an architect build your house or would you just have some guy off the street who thinks they know how to build a house, build your house? Which would you choose? And the argument is always, you know, well. Same is true for instruction, right? And it is, it is absolutely. There's a practice here. There's, there's, um, there's methods we should be following. Um, do you need a degree? Not necessarily. It might help you get a job, but you certainly need to know how to do the work and how to get those performance results that we're after because ultimately that's what matters. Yes, thank you. So, Cammie, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Well, the one word would be I do sales, um, but it's, it's much more nuanced than that. So I work with clients, prospective clients and existing clients to identify challenges, problems they're trying to solve, and then put in place a plan to help them then continue that with our team. <laughs> so I don't figure it all out. Um, I don't figure out what the solution is going to look like, but I am a salesperson. So I'm writing the contract. I'm scoping out the work. I'm, um, you know, building a case for why this is important for you clients. Um, a lot of it's rapport building, a lot of it's, uh, you know, talking the language of instructional design um, in order to effectively sell the services of my team who are going to be taking it much more deeply with you. That might've been more than 30 seconds, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, so I think it's important for the audience to understand that there's that, that very same role exists in an enterprise. If you're part of an instructional design or learning experience team, there is somebody who's interfacing with potential clients, prospects or whatever. They're just internal mm -hmm. helping them determine you know, what makes sense given their needs, their situation, et cetera. So, you know, the, and I, sales shouldn't be a bad word uh, if it's consultative sales, if it's helping the client meet their needs uh, with the right solutions, you know, that's, there, there's power in that and there's a huge value in that. Um, yeah. And it's really where the performance consulting process starts. And in fact, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, our sales team, we're going through a performance consulting training program right now. Um, mm -hmm. you know, 26 years in, I'm getting trained in performance consulting as a model. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's not different from instructional design, you know, as a concept, it's, you know, what's your current state, where do you want to be? What's the gap? How are we going to get there? Right. So identifying the problems and figuring out your way, your way forward. So 
we're thinking about it more at an organizational level because, you know, we want to be a, a company strategic partner. We're not just here to take an order from you. Like you want, oh, you want some e-learning and we're going to build you, you know, five hours of e-learning with, you know, in storyline with, you know, blah, blah, blah. We want to help create better results for your organization. So, so it really, that performance consulting starts, you know, from the first time I talk to a client, that's, that's what we are all about. Well, let me uh, switch gears again here as, as a lifelong learner, uh, and you just kind of answer this question a bit, but but your, what's your current focus or next focus for your own personal learning? I know you're going through the performance consulting uh, workshop, but so are are you learning anything in particular and are you writing about it anywhere that uh, people might uh, get access to it? Oh, that's a good question. So I have not been very active on my blog for the last few years. Um, that's sort of starting again. I mean, I'm, I'm working on the book right now. So a lot of it's going into to the rewrite and I'm, I'm on deadline. So, um, I got another month to go or so for the first, first round of edits to that. So a lot of the, um, sort of personal learning I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm reading through the latest books, the books that have come out in the last few years. I just want to make sure that what I'm adding to the accidental instructional designer is, you know, up to date, current, you know, pointing people in the right direction, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also going through, um, so there's the performance consulting training. Um, I'm also actually going through a leadership training program at Kineo. So I'm, I'm part of, a, you know, I've been with Kineo for 13 years. Um, I'm technically part of the senior leadership team. I have a team of salespeople that I actually manage now. Um, and so going through a leadership training program is really interesting. It's the kind of thing we design for our clients all the time. I haven't, you know, we don't eat your... Often when you're at a small learning company, you don't eat your own dog food. You don't take training programs. You don't go through um, e-learning programs. But we are part now of a larger organization. Kineo is owned by City and Guilds, which is a, a, a nonprofit organization out of the UK um, doing really interesting work around skills development, have been around since the 18, 1878, so 140 years, very storied institution, the City of London and the Guilds of London. Um, so really fortunate to be part of this larger organization and we're getting, you know, investment back in our own skills um, and, and bits. So, um, so I do try, I probably on LinkedIn more than anything these days, as, as are you, right? It's sort of the place where people are. Um, less on Twitter. I was very, I mean, I've been on all the social media platforms over the years. I have cracked open my blog a little bit and I do write sometimes on the Kineo uh, blog as well. Well, I'll be sure to put the, in the show notes to the YouTube video uh, the URLs for that so that people can follow up and, and, and check out what you're doing. Let me shift gears here again. Uh, this is about uh, the language in our profession. And my, my question is, is there a performance improvement or an instructional design term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or it's misconstrued or you just want to put your own personal spin on it. What do you have for us? Yeah, I, I was reflecting on this um, prior to the call. I think the word I, the natural word for me is to always come back to is instructional design. I mean, that's, that's how I think about the practice. Um, and as I said earlier in our session today, instructional design is a term that I think gets mu misused a ton, right? So what is instructional design? It's the design of instruction but at many organizations. And if you look at job listings out there, you're trying to find a job as an instructional designer, companies list everything. Um, and so, you know, they'll talk about creating needs analysis, doing the needs assessments, identifying the performance gaps. So that's one thing. I, I, I have talked about this as the learning pie, right? There's that's a piece of the pie that's about learning and pedagogy and understanding how adults learn. Then there's this whole creative component, which is, writing scripts and doing graphics and creating games and, um, you know, finding ways to pull people in and storytelling and video production. There's a whole creative side to it. There's also um, the big technology component to a lot of what we do. I mean, digital learning is here to stay. It is not going away. Um, so, you know, companies will be hiring for an instructional designer and they expect them to run the LMS. They expect them to write 
you know, script, um, build e-learning courses in Storyline or Captivate or whatever the tool is, do the QA testing, understand how SCORM works, know about XAPI, right? Just tons of stuff in that, you know, data analytics. And then finally, there's the business element of it. So you have to be a consultant, you have to, you know, run a project, you have to be a project manager, you have to manage the budget. I mean, it's a huge skill set. And yet, it's called an instructional designer, you know, or a learning design, whatever it's called at your organization. And it's just, there's so many shades of instructional design. And, you know, again, back to finding what your sweet spot is, you, you know, you've got to be this generalist in this field. I think it's true across all of training and development these days. You can't, we can't just be in our own box thinking about all I do is e-learning design because e-learning lives within this larger system of training and performance at an organization or just classroom training. No, you can't think, can't think that way these days either because we are, we're flipping the classroom. People are working remote. You've got to be thinking about how technology plays into that. And so it's, it's just a, it's big and messy. It's not a neat little profession and instructional design does not mean the same thing to all people. So, you know, I don't know how you would define instructional design guy. How would, how would you define it? <laughs> well, I, you know, so that's, that is the age old thing. So I, I always gravitated to instructional systems design, looking at the design of a system of instruction. And it's the difference between being the systems engineer versus a product engineer. So, but, but that's my own personal spin on it because I, I just know, and everybody else in the audience should know that this language is messy. It's imprecise. So an instructional designer can do everything A to Z or they can simply do build e-learning courses. But, but so, you know, in every case, you have to be careful about what does that mean? So it's good to do some active listening, some probing about, you know, what does somebody mean by, by when they use that term? Because it can mean so many different things. Um, and I think you're right that in the job ads and all this, and you read about this all the time on LinkedIn and other places that the job ads ask for everything Yep. Um, and I think it's probably important for people to know that if you're just starting out, you're not going to have everything. You, but these are this is the list of things that you probably eventually have to learn to some extent and do be able to do well enough, depending on the kind of organization you're in and how they've divided up the jobs. I mean, they could have everybody's a generalist, everybody does everything, or sometimes you're a specialist and you work together in a team and do kind of handoffs from one part of the process to the next. So it does vary and it's, it's, it's kind of the issue, but I, so that is an interesting term that you picked. Um, let me, let, so my next question is about some of the people, and this is to provide some guidance to our audience. So of late, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but so of late, who are some of the people or the books or articles that you might point people to um, who are influential uh, to your practice and you think others should perhaps follow up with them? Who do you have? Um, well, yeah, I've listed, I've listed them all. Um, no, I'm <laughs> sure I'm, I'm missing a few. I'm, um, I've been reading Carl Kopp's, um, and he wrote it with someone and I'm, I apologize, I can't remember who, but it's a, it's a book on micro learning that I'm sure. Um, yeah, thank you, Sharon Bowler, of course. Um, and it's great. Like it's, it's such a good primer. Like don't read an actual instructional designer. Go read, go read that. Like he goes through, you know, the learning theory, cognitive, behavioral, effective domains. Like it's, it's great. It's a real basic. Um, it's not just basic, but then, then also, also looking at how you can apply micro learning and, you know, micro learning, um, you know, what that means defines that defines what the use case is for it. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's exceptional. Carl, Carl's great. Um, I have, uh, I have Will Talheimer's book. I haven't started reading it yet, but it's, um, and, and I don't know the name of it because I was sitting next to my bookshelf and I had all my books <laughs> next to me um, and then I had to move outside. Um, uh, it's his new learning survey uh, assessment mm -hmm. uh, book. I mean, he's, he's always just written great stuff. I mean, he's pushing performance. Um, so he, he's definitely a name I would start with. Um, you know, back to the, to the basics, you know, Ruth Clark's books, I think are all fantastic e-learning and the science of instruction. That's a great one to start with. I'm not sure when that was last updated, um, but I know there have been a few additions out there. Um, 
and I would also highly recommend Julie Dirksen's uh, Design for How People Learn and Kathy Moore Map It, um, you know, which is all Kathy Moore's uh, action mapping, you know, which really helps you focus on what is it that people need to be able to do um, at the end of the day. Now, there's, you know, there's all the performance bits and then there's all the pretty engaging bits as well, too, that we have to think about. So, um, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career. I never had to be the graphic artist. I have, you know, I have a creative, I'm a good writer, but I'm not a graphics person um, and I'm not a builder. I spent, um, when I shifted into sales actually for um, up until about last year, now, I've, now I'm back focusing just on custom learning content because that's really my sweet spot, but I was selling our learning management system um, and that was hugely uncomfortable for me to move into that space because the LMS was like technology. And I was sort of like, that was my piece of the pie that was like, ew, I don't like technology. Ironic, right? I'm in e-learning, but you know, I always had developers, builders, et cetera, to focus on that stuff. But then I started selling the LMS. And I mean, I, not that I speak PHP or anything by any means, but just really understanding how that piece of technology fits into the business hugely eye-opening to me. I'd been in the business for 20 years and then I, I sort of like, wow, okay, there's, there's this whole other thing that adds a whole other layer of complexity to what's happening in organizations and how an LMS or an LXP today or whatever the platform, the learning ecosystem that you're using integrates in with larger HRIS systems. And like, it's this huge, messy, complicated beast. And you know, like it or not, it's part of what we have to think about as practitioners in this space, um, you know, unless you're just going to ignore it, which some people do too. Um, so again, another long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like you've kind of come full circle. You said earlier that you had been talking to the customer and their needs and the instructional designers and talking to the IT people. So it seems like you're kind of back in doing that and translating, understanding the business requirements and translating those for those who are on the instructional uh, design side of things. Uh, Cami, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. My final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, particularly people new to the field? What, what, would, what would your uh, guidance be? Ah, well, um, group hug, you know, you're not in this alone. Uh, you may be figuring this out, you know, for the first time, but you, there's so many resources and community that you can tap into. Um, there's a lot going on on LinkedIn right now with, uh, in this field, connect with people like Guy, learn from people like Guy. Guy, you post all the time. It's great. I always am, you know, gleaning something and it's, you know, it's, it's refreshing. It's, it's a refresher, right? We talk about space learning and retention. It's like, it's really good to kind of keep repeating and, and, um, and, and hearing, you know, core concepts again. So I, I, you know, dive into it. You, it, it's, it's such a vast field and there are so many directions that you can go into. You know, I happen to land in sales. I do not identify as a salesperson. Um, I still think of myself as an instructional designer. Um, you know, in terms of a career path, I just, there's so many places that you can take it. Um, so, you know, get your feet wet, get started, get grounded, start learning, have that open mindset. Usually the people who fall into this field are really curious. They're, you know, often there's a lot of people who wanted to be teachers or writers, you know, there's a lot of commonality and kind of the skill sets of people who fall into instructional design or training as a field. You didn't mean to cut hair you didn't imagine when you were a little kid that you were going to grow up and become an instructional designer, um, but here you are. So I think um, embrace it with, you know, passion, find your, find your purpose and, and, you know, go forth and be prosperous and, and have fun. Um, you know, really kind of back to my hippie roots. Like I feel like we, um, we do make a difference in people's lives ultimately. And if we're designing great solutions, they're going to have results and have impact on, you know, yes, maybe on the business itself, but on the lives of individual people who are trying to do their job better with less stress so they can go home and take care of their families and tuck their kids in at night and, you know, have a solid paycheck, all that stuff. I think we really do fit into the system in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, it, it, it's great. 
So true. So true. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for doing this interview with me. Uh, I, I wish you the best. I'm looking forward to seeing the next uh, edition of your book. Well, thank you, guys. This has been really fun. Um, always happy to get chatting. <laughs> <laughs> cheers. All right. Cheers, all.